In August 1939, as storm clouds loomed over Europe, a mysterious aircraft arrived at No. 25 Squadron, based at RAF Northolt. On the surface, it looked like a Bristol Blenheim Mark 1F. Those able to evade the tight security and look closely would have noticed aerials on its nose and wings. A look inside would have revealed a host of mysterious black boxes fitted amidships. This Blenheim was the most secret aircraft in British service at the time. Inside its frumpy frame, it carried the first operational air intercept radar. Weighing 600 pounds, it had been painstakingly assembled by hand before its fitment to the Blenheim. Development of an air intercept radar system had started under absolute secrecy at the Air Ministry Research Establishment in August 1936. Things proceeded rapidly. The first complete airborne radar system, consisting of a transmitter, receiver and display, was installed in a Hayford bomber. It operated at 45 megahertz. Ground-based trials were conducted in March 1937. By August of that year, the wavelength, and hence the size of the aerial system, had been reduced to four feet and it was installed in an Avro Anson for flight trials at Martlesham Heath. It was later flown on a fairy battle for further development. This set, which demonstrated ranges of two to three miles in its sea search or air-to-surface vessel mode and a mile in air intercept mode, formed the basis for all the wartime airborne radars that were to come. With frequency increased to 200 MHz and system power to 50 watts to improve the sensitivity, the first hand-built examples of AI Mark I were installed in six Blenheim fighters of a special flight of No. 25 Squadron. Their task was to trial this revolutionary aircraft, calibrate its radar and train operators to use it. Having undergone trials, the first operational air intercept radars, designated AI Mark III as Mark II was a failure, were installed in the Blenheim 1Fs of No. 23, 25, 29, 219, 600 and 604 squadrons in May 1940. Transmission of the AI Mark III was via a double dipole aerial arranged to look a bit like an arrowhead. Reception was by two swept-back dipole antennas on one of the wings giving elevation and two vertical dipole aerials on the other wing giving azimuth. Target position was shown on two cathode ray tube displays showing azimuth and elevation. It was a very finicky system, but it was what the RAF had. Only a few years previously, the Blenheim had once been regarded as a particularly fast and dynamic aircraft. A mid-wing monoplane powered by two 840-horsepower Bristol Mercury 8 radial engines, it was capable of over 300 miles an hour when lightly loaded and 285 in normal trim. Derived from a commercial aircraft commissioned by the newspaper magnate Lord Rothermere, it had been adopted by the RAF as the inevitability of war with Germany became apparent. Blenheims were initially introduced as light bombers. A thousand pounds of bombs could be carried internally and there were two 303 machine guns, one firing forward in the wing route and the other in a semi-retractable dorsal turret. Because of the Blenheim's speed relative to biplane fighters, it was assumed that it would rarely be caught and attacked. With British industry struggling to manufacture enough fighters, in the late 1930s a long-ranged fighter variant of the Blenheim was developed by simply attaching a belly pack of four 303 machine guns and 2,000 rounds. When this aircraft faced combat, the folly of deploying a now quite slow, quite large and quite unmanoeuvrable aircraft against BF-109s was immediately clear. But needs must and the RAF was critically short of all sorts of aircraft. So just two hours into the war on the 3rd of September, pilot officer John Isaac was to become the first Briton to die in the conflict when his Blenheim 1F crashed near Hendon. Later in the evening, 601 Squadron Blenheims were scrambled to investigate a mysterious radio signal that turned out to be emissions from a faulty refrigerator. It was an inauspicious start. And things would get much worse for the Blenheim crews. In the summer of 1940, the day fighters were deployed to interdict the German Blitzkrieg and they suffered horrific losses. Even the BF-110, itself a rather flawed machine, was faster, more manoeuvrable and it had much heavier armament than the Blenheim. France fell, and there was then a lull as both sides gathered their forces for the inevitable Battle of Britain. 
Blenheim Day fighters were much too vulnerable to BF-109s to be used alongside Hurricanes and Spitfires over land, but they did operate over the channel at times. At night, they had their role to play, though. Their first night action took place on the 18th and 19th of June when Heinkels attacked bomber bases in East Anglia. Number 23 Squadron launched seven non-radar equipped aircraft which made repeated attacks on the bomber formations guided by ground control. The Blenheim's lack of firepower was immediately apparent. Their crews close to point-blank range, sometimes as close as 50 yards to deliver their attacks. Firing off their entire ammunition supply resulted in hundreds of hits on the Heinkels yet only two were shot down at the cost of two Blenheims and a Spitfire down by return fire. Two Blenheim crewmen were killed, but the others successfully bailed out. Another flaw was revealed in this engagement. Although the Blenheim's large glass house made seeing the bombers somewhat easier, the Perspex was not bulletproof and a few hits could easily disable the pilot or damage the controls. There was then another long lull while the Luftwaffe concentrated on day attacks. But on the 22nd of July came a major moment in air warfare. Flight officer Glyn Jumbo Ashfield, his observer, pilot officer Jeffrey Morris and radar operator Sergeant Reg Leyland intercepted a Dornier 17 off the Sussex coast. They were on patrol and were alerted to the intruder's presence by ground control. Leyland detected the contact and steered his pilot to make the intercept. After five minutes, Morris saw the Dornier silhouetted against the moon. Ashfield redlined the throttles and they closed on the bomber from astern. Just as they approached the radar's minimum range of four or five hundred feet, Jumbo Ashfield opened fire, taking the German completely by surprise. The Dornier lurched to starboard and began to dive. Ashfield followed him, firing all the way despite his canopy being covered in oil from the German's damaged engines. The bomber crashed in flames five miles south of Bognor. The minimum range of AI Mark III was another weakness to add to the package's tally. On a dark night, there'd be a blind spot between the radar losing signal and the pilot visually acquiring the target. As the Luftwaffe's hopes of overwhelming the RAF by day began to wane, so the Blitz began. On the night of the 3rd and 4th of September, Blenheims from No. 25 Squadron were directed to engage a large force of bombers heading for Liverpool. Pilot officer Michael Herrick's Blenheim crew were on patrol, struggling with a malfunctioning radar set, when they nearly ran into a Heinkel HE-111 caught in searchlight beams ahead of them. Herrick, a New Zealander, opened fire from point-blank range and the bomber spiralled down. In the process, the Heinkel's tail gunner scored his own hits shattering the Perspex windshield and leaving Herrick's face and eyes peppered with shrapnel. But as he turned his damaged aircraft for home, he nearly ran into a second Heinkel that had become detached from its formation. Again, he fired from very close range, inside of 30 yards. The Heinkel disintegrated. Having expended all of his ammunition, the crew did now manage to return to base. In reports from the time, ranges under 100 yards seem most common for Blenheim attacks. Part of this is doubtless related to the challenges of spotting another aircraft on a dark night. Two weeks later, Herrick was at it again. On the night of the 13th-14th of September, while flying a patrol north of London, he was directed by his radar operator to another 111. Climbing up behind the bomber, he opened fire, prompting its crew to jettison his bomb load. He continued his attack and the German aircraft went down out of control and exploded but not before its rear gunner caused minor damage to the Blenheim. Herrick and his crew thus scored three of the four nocturnal kills made by Fighter Command in September. The other score was by 600 Squadron on the 16th-17th. Flight Lieutenant Charles Pritchard caught a Heinkel as it came in over the sea. He hosed it with machine gun fire until it burst in flames and crashed near Becks Hill. Although the Blenheims flew every night, kills were sporadic. Their only score in October was a pair of HE-111s on the night of the 15th-16th. One went down near Brentwood, the other near Red Hill. The latter was the first kill for flight officer Philip Ensor, who went on to have a brief but very successful night intruder career, mainly flying the Douglas Havoc. These intruder missions were also pioneered by Blenheims. The idea was to fly over to positions close to the German airfields in France and catch the exhausted Luftwaffe crews as they returned from their sorties. The tactic required excellent navigation and timing, but when it worked, it worked spectacularly well. 
Missions began on December the 21st, 1940, and the intruders scored their first kill on the 2nd of January, 41, near Cannes. Ensor caught a returning Heinkel and shot it down, although that success required the use of all 2,000 rounds of 303 aboard. Lack of firepower was the fundamental problem with the platform. 303 rounds in general simply lack the stopping power required to reliably stop a Heinkel, Junkers 88 or Dornier 17. The AI Mark III's minimum range issues, the very short effective range of the machine guns, and the lack of speed of the Blenheim itself meant that the Venn diagram for a successful engagement was quite slight. It was enough firepower, however, to down a rare Fokker Wolf 200 Condor on the night of the 21st-22nd April near Saint-Léger. Flight Lieutenant, later Wing Commander, Bertie Hoare spotted two aircraft approaching the field and attacked the second. He reported a sudden bright flash as he fired from 50 yards. The enemy aircraft then fell to bits in the air. Fragments flew past the Blenheim on all sides and burning pieces were strewn around all over a wide area on the ground. When Hoare and his crew got back to base, they found a three feet square piece of armour sticking out of one of the wing leading edges. This dramatic action was one of the last conducted by the Blenheim as a night fighter. I believe that the last sorties were in early May, as in the early months of 1941, squadrons began to re-equip with the much more effective Bristol Bowfighter. Although similar in size to the Blenheim, the Bowfighter weighed 70% more than its predecessor. Early versions were seen as disappointingly slow, but they were still 40 to 60 miles an hour faster. Perhaps more importantly, the Bowfighters were fitted with a new radar. The AI Mark IV had been developed with the assistance of the EMI company of all people. Turning the aerial system from horizontal polarization to vertical and incorporating a central modulator to control the system brought about a significant reduction in minimum range over that of the AI Mark III. It was effective from 400 feet to 20,000. The night fighter Bowfighter scored its first kill on the night of November the 15th, 16th, when an aircraft from 604 Squadron destroyed a Junkers 88 near Chichester in West Sussex. Lack of numbers and the inability of British radars to track intruders once they were over the coast meant that they could do little to alleviate the death and destruction of the Blitz. But their pilots, and those of the more numerous, if less effective and less heralded Blenheims, did their best. The radar-equipped Blenheim night fighter is thus a vital, but essentially forgotten, development in the history of air warfare.